U.S.'s offshore detention center in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, marked its 10th anniversary earlier this year, a judge in Spain has relaunched an investigation into the alleged torture, torture of detainees there. The development came on the heels of a British probe into the U.S. CIA's so-called renditions of war prisoners to Libya. Today, we turn to Glenn L. Carl, who spent 23 years in the CIA as a spy who, in his own words, quote, broke laws, stole and lied every day about almost everything to everyone around me. Carl worked the spectrum of CIA spy assignments, gathering intelligence wherever it could be found, whether in a war zone or a highbrow salon in Europe. He was inspired to join the agency because he was devoted to its mission and to ideals larger than his own self-interest. He also thrived within what he calls the gray world of the CIA, where he could, quote, accept doubt, realize there is no certainty, and yet act with principle, finding meaning and purpose in confusion. His belief in the goals of this storied agency were unshaken until he was called on to become an interrogator, assigned to squeeze intelligence from a man believed to be a high-level al-Qaeda terrorist. As an interrogator within the shadowy borders of the global war on terror, Glenn Carl came to believe his captive was innocent and that he had become part of a world where fear-fueled delusions reigned. In his new memoir, The Interrogator and Education, Glenn Carl analyzes his own role in the war on terror and the larger political context in the post-9-11 world that has led his agency and others to value brute force over thoughtful strategy. He is the most senior CIA member to write about his experience as an interrogator and his book is an essential guidepost for anyone mapping the U.S.'s trajectory to a nation that today scoffs at the Geneva Convention and undermines its own constitution. Glenn Carl joins me in studio. Welcome to Uprising. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, your last position at the CIA was acting and then deputy national intelligence officer for transnational threats on the National Intelligence Council, which is the U.S. intelligence community's most senior position for strategic analysis of critical national security issues. That's pretty that's pretty high up there. You retired in 2007. What led you to writing this book? Well, I felt... It really was my obligation and, and duty. It, it may sound corny, but it, is, uh, it really is the truth. Uh, my colleagues and I take our oath and our devotion to uh, service uh, very, very seriously. It's a, it's a strange, unusual, and often isolating career. And people choose it because uh, we believe and hope that we are serving something that uh, means more than personal uh, advancement. And when I found that the uh, orders I received and the programs we were engaged in were undermining the meaning of our oath and what uh, we were seeking to preserve and protect, um, and I was one of the few who knew about this, I felt really an obligation uh, to have the American people know what we have done to ourselves. Mm. Now, your book is full of redactions. It's got whole chunks that have been just blacked out. Um, First of all, who made those redactions and why did you decide to keep them in? Well, initially, uh, I wrote the book to be about 100,000 words. The uh, CIA uh, censored or redacted about 40%, 40,000 words of the first manuscript. You had to pass it by them? I must by law. In fact, Mm -hmm. I am one of the... uh, case officers, operations officers in the CIA, are the only category of Americans who do not have uh, First Amendment protections. Uh, Anything I write for the rest of my life concerning politics, history, foreign affairs, uh, I must submit for review by the CIA's Publications Review Board. Now, the Supreme Court has decided that their mandate is to protect sources and methods. That's a legitimate uh, uh, task. You don't want to have a person say, well, uh, a minister in a foreign government is working for the United States CIA. That would be his death and a huge political problem. So that's that's legitimate. However, uh, it was clear that the agency and the administration in the whole didn't really want to have my book published because they went way beyond 
the mandate of sources and methods to censor things just uh, at the level of harassment. Hmm. Uh, I quoted T.S. Eliot, and they censored that, and they can't do that. They censored T.S. Eliot? Uh, I, I responded to them that I understood that perha perhaps they were striking a blow against snobbery, <laughs> but uh, that that really was not legally what they were allowed to do. Hmm. It, it went on and on and on. How many times did you write this book? Oh, my gosh. Probably a dozen times over, uh, each time in an iteration of trying to address the censoring that uh, I had to respond to. Uh, and I, I could give hours of episodes. I described myself at one point as having, uh, I found, here's a quote, I said, I found uh, headquarters, my colleagues and I all disagreed, and they censored that. Hmm. Well. Despite the redactions, the story of what happened, what you did, how you changed your thinking um, as, an, as an example of what has likely been happening throughout this so-called war on terror comes through. Let's talk about the man named codenamed, I suppose, Captus, C-A-P-T-U-S, who is who is supposed to be this high-level um, Al-Qaeda terrorist, HVTs, high-value targets, as they're called, uh, that you were brought in to interrogate. You can't say exactly who he was, where he was from, but he was, we know, one of these people who was rendered, meaning removed from his home country and taken somewhere else, right? Yes. So he was at the... He, you were brought in to interrogate him, and you assumed that what you were told was true, that he was a high-value target, that he was an al-Qaeda terrorist, and your job was to make him talk. That's right. Well, of course, I assume that my colleagues, maybe it's naive to say, of course, but it, it really isn't, uh, that my colleagues uh, are people uh, of principle uh, who work uh, very hard and who, who uh, check uh, their assumptions and, and uh, review their conclusions all the time. And the effort put into tracking this man and following his life for years was huge. So when I was brought in from outside, I had not been involved in his operation, the case about him before. Uh, the sensible assumption is that the institution, many, many people working many man years on him would know what they were talking about. And uh, you take the, the file and then you go with it. I found that many of the assumptions uh, shaped the perceptions, and the perceptions became an orthodoxy, which then became a dogma, which was impossible to challenge, and people accepted it uncritically. And that proved disastrous for this man, for our operation, and in a larger sense, for our understanding and then miscues with respect to the threat from terrorism. How did you come to the realization that he was not who you were led to believe he was? Well, there's a few, as I say, the file was huge on this man. The agency knew everything about him, or believed it did. But I was the first one, the only one, to sit 16 or 17 or more hours a day, every day, three feet from him, looking him in the eye, and talking to him. And my job, the career that I had, was to assess people. That, that was my job. Interrogation has nothing to do with my career or, frankly, with the CIA's. But looking someone in the eye and understanding what motivates the person, what fears he has, uh, what makes him laugh, uh, how he thinks about his family, how manipulative he is, what are his convictions, that's what I did for my entire career. And I came progressively to find that, fundamentally, he was answering truthfully. Not always. He was scared. Uh, he was duplicitous sometimes. He was trying to protect himself. But fundamentally, he was... Uh, answering in a straightforward way and in a way that convinced me progressively he was not a jihadist and was not what we thought. What kinds of methods were used on him by you and others? Because, of course, when we think about the war on terror, when we think about interrogation, we think about enhanced interrogation techniques, right. which are a euphemism for torture. Well, uh, when I was first told, go speak to so-and-so at headquarters. He will brief you on the case and tell you what you're supposed to do. Uh, the officer who became my headquarters uh, alter ego, I ran the operation in the field for my time, and then he did at headquarters, which is standard. Uh, he said, you will do whatever it takes to get this man to talk. Do you understand? Mm. And I immediately understood. Uh, and it's an important conversation, so I'll relate it, if I may, mm -hmm. uh, before answering directly. And my response was, well, we don't do that, to which he responded, well, we do now. And I thought, holy smoke, this is just unbelievable. And I said, well, what happened? We would need at least a direct presidential order to do something like that. 
And he said, we haven't. What we a had, direct presidential order? Yes. What we had was the letter written by John Yu in the Department of Justice, uh, which said essentially torture is what um, anything, our guidance was, uh, if a measure is not severe and lasting, the article is important, severe and lasting, it is therefore then not torture. So it could be severe, it could be lasting, but if it's Not both, severe and lasting. Right. So, so theoretically, Benefit. suppose you have a welt in the side of your head from being whacked that goes away after three days. That's not lasting, is it? Or if you're crazy for half a day and then you come back, that's not lasting either. I just thought it was a stunning, stunning uh, bit of guidance. But that was what it was. And so I, I, I said we would need a direct presidential order. I was told, well, we have it. And then I said, well, suppose... Something happens that I consider, and I didn't, I couldn't bring myself to use the word torture or physical. It was inconceivable to me. So I stumbled or hesitated. I said, suppose something happens that I consider unacceptable. What do I do then? And he said, well, then and he gets disdainful. He said, well, then you walk out of the room and whatever happens, you won't have seen. And so nothing will have happened, will it? And I thought, oh, my God, the rules have really changed. Now, to more directly answer your question... There are two ways of interrogating. There are physical and psychological measures used. And I decided from the first instant that I simply would have nothing to do. I would not do or be party of anything physical. I wouldn't do it. However, we had been taught that the psychological measures induce cooperation or manip make someone more easy to manipulate to obtain information and are not lasting. And I'd had them done to me in my training. So at first I thought, well, oh boy. In the end, when I, when I arrived overseas, I decided what I would do is sit in front of this man and talk. And that's all I ever did until the man was, and this is part of the narrative arc of the whole story, he was removed really from my control and sent to our most severe interrogation facility where then the, uh, what came to be called enhanced interrogation techniques were used and I could not stop them. So you essentially assumed that he had been tortured, or did you actually know for a fact? Well, uh, it's a complicated uh, answer on, on torture. I saw the, the default environment in the facility where he was sent after, for me it was after nearly three months, uh, used enhanced interrogation techniques, of which there are two kinds. There are the psychological, I guess you'd call them psychological measures, or the measures that play upon the senses. And those are, that is heat, light, temperature, uh, sleep, rhythm, disruption, um, discomfort, and so on. That's just how things were. Uh, more direct physical measures, which, which in the jargon of the agency's doctrine were called uh, enhanced measures, where the ones I mentioned just now are standard, uh, those I did not see used and, and forbid their being used in my brief time there. Mm -hmm. And that's the physical kind of stuff. I'm speaking with Glenn L. Carl, who spent 23 years in the clandestine service of the Central Intelligence Agency, where he worked in a number of overseas posts on four continents and in Washington, D.C. He's written a book about his experiences during the so-called War on Terror, called The Interrogator and Education. Well, Let's talk about the um, w what your experience with this man, codenamed Captus, told you about the U.S. government's relationship with international law, with the Geneva Convention, with the U.S.'s own constitution, um, and how that also um, has led you to maybe rethink the way in which um, agencies like the CIA operate. Well, uh, the two parts there. The, the second one and the rethinking I'll, I'll go back to uh, mm -hmm. and after I try to address the first one. Uh, I didn't finish the conversation, the initial briefing that I had, which is very important. I was, I'm convinced, uh, unusual in that in that exchange, which is the first minute that I had been briefed on this case, um, where I left off, the conversation continued. And so I said, well, we don't do that. What, do I, what happens? What do I do if I think something is unacceptable? He answered disdainfully, as I said. And so th at that point, I thought, well, this is clearly, it was obvious to me, uh, the critical moment in my then 17 or 18-year career. And I thought, 
perhaps the critical moment or issue the CIA had confronted in, in its history. It, it immediately brought to mind for me, frankly, uh, the disaster of My Lai or the internment of Japanese Americans in World War II. This was a big, big issue. So I thought, of all the times in my career, this is not the time just to roll over. And so I raised um, a question that operations officers don't. It's a legal question that the lawyer should argue about, and presumably they had. So I said, well, what about the Geneva Convention? And the answer to me was, well, which flag do you serve? Hmm. And that's the title of the first chapter. Um, and I thought, well, clearly at this point, there's no advantage, there's no point in my arguing any anymore here. The fellow had informed me quite competently, my colleague, that the president, the attorney general, the office of general counsel of the White House, the director of the CIA, the director of the counterterrorism center, and on down, had all formally, legally authorized and ordered the operation and the procedures that I was being told to do. So on one side you have that, and on the other you have Glenn Carl, the equivalent of a lieutenant colonel, who's been read into the case for three minutes. So it was an acute issue, but an immediately apparent one for me. Now, the second point, uh, you'll have to half remind me of what it was at this point. Uh, uh, well, the, my question uh, mostly was about how the U.S.'s re, um, relationship to international law and right. the Geneva Convention changed right, after right. this. Well, there I think actually the focus in the question and other in most people's minds is on the CIA and what it did. And I think that is misdirected a little bit. The CIA was very careful, as I was at my own level, as I've described, to say, what are we authorized to do? We will not do anything that is, one, illegal, and two, not formally authorized and ordered. So the agency responds and serves, responds to and serves the executive. The focus needs to be on the executive branch because they had said that this is legal and they had obtained, they, the White House, the formal guidance of the Department of Justice. Now, they gained the system, they subverted the law, they bypassed checks and balances, they undermined the, the, the uh, spirit as well as the letter of the laws, um, th but, and that posed the dilemma for agency officers of what do you do when your direct orders contravene your understanding of the spirit and the letter of your legal obligations. Mm. But the focus needs to be on the administration rather than the CIA. Well, Glenn Carl, there's so much more to discuss, so we'd like to have you back on tomorrow's show for a part two. I want to thank you very much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. I'm honored. Glenn Carl is uh, the senior most member of the CIA to write about uh, interrogations in the war on terror. He's going to be speaking at Park La Brea this Wednesday at 7 p.m. at Park La Brea Auditorium at 6200 West 3rd Street in Los Angeles. He'll be back on the show tomorrow for part two of our interview. For some